Welcome to lecture 1.5, Multiplication Tables. At this point in the course, we are almost ready to introduce the formal definition of a group. In this lecture, we will introduce one more useful algebraic tool for better understanding groups, and these are multiplication tables. We will also look more closely at inverses of the actions in a group. And the last thing we will do is we will introduce a new group of size 8 called the quaternions, which frequently arise in theoretical physics. Okay, so let's start with inverses. So if G is a generator in a group G, then by following the so-called G arrow backwards is also an action. We call that the inverse of G, denoted by G inverse. More generally, if G is re represented by not just a generator or an arrow in the Cayley diagram, but a path, then G inverse is the action achieved by tracing out this path in reverse. So note that by construction, um, G times G inverse is the same thing as G inverse times G, which is the identity. So it doesn't matter which order you do G and G inverse in, they cancel each other out. And here, again, E is the identity or the do-nothing action. Sometimes we denote the identity action by E or by 1, especially if we're emphasizing multiplication, or sometimes even by 0 if the operation, the action, is, is addition. Although usually we will stick with E. Okay, so let's practice with an example. Here's a Cayley diagram on the left of a group that we've seen before. And let's compute the inverses of these elements. So the first one is R. So R inverse is what you do to undo the action of R. So if, if you do R, then how do you get back to where you started? Well, you do R squared. So R inverse times R squared is because R times R squared is the identity, and so is R squared times R. Next one, F. So F inverse. If you start at the identity, or if you start anywhere, it doesn't matter, and you apply F, you go up here, then how do you undo yourself? Well, you apply F again. So F inverse is just F, because F times F is the identity, and, well, trivially, if I swap the order, the same thing holds. Next, what about RF? So if we start here and we do RF, well, then how do we get back to where we started? We do RF again. So um, RF inverse is RF. Let me write that down. So RF, because RF times RF is the identity. And again, trivially, if we, if we swap the order, it's the same thing. And now notice that this is not the only way we could get back to the identity. We could do um, RF, and then we could do F R squared. But notice, if you remember, um, F R squared is equal to R times F. And you can possibly just remember that, or you can always check that anytime you do F R squared, look, we're at, that's the same thing as R F. R F. Okay, last one. Uh, R squared F inverse. So if you start here, you do R squared F inverse. How do you undo that? Well, R squared F. So that's R squared F, because R squared F times R squared F is the identity, which is R squared F times R squared F. So notice that these three elements actually were their own inverse. So these elements, we say, have order 2, because if you do them twice, you get back to the identity. This one, we say, is order 3, because you have to apply R three times, 1, 2, 3, to get back to the identity. Okay, so now to the main topic of this lecture, multiplication tables. And the idea behind this is, since we can use a Cayley diagram with nodes labeled by actions as a group calculator, in some sense, then we can create a group multiplication table that shows how every pair of group actions combine. This is just like what we did in elementary school, with multiplication tables of of the numbers 1 up to 10, 1 up to 12, but now we have group elements. So this is best uh, illustrated by diving in and doing an example. So let's fill out a multiplication table for V4. So um, since the order of multiplication can matter, it does not in this course, let's stick with the convention that the entry in row G and column H is the element GH. And so that means 
If you want to multiply g by h, you go to you go down to g and then across. Well, let's write it out like this. So you you take g here and h here, and then this entry right there is going to be the element g times h. Okay, so here's the multiplication table, and you can see that we have e v h r here and e v h r here. So these elements. So um, if you want to take v times h, you take v here times h, and you you go to this element, and that's r. And here you can right away see how to multiply any two elements in this group. Okay, so some remarks on the comments of multiplication tables. So the first comment um, is, is that the first column and the first row repeat themselves. So why is this? Well, because the first entry in the previous table was just the identity. So you don't really need that row or column. It doesn't tell you anything. You know how to multiply things by the identity. So sometimes these things will be omitted. Now there's, there's a, a nice program called Group Explorer, which is freely available online. And it was made in conjunction with the Visual Group Theory book. And in that program, you can enter a whole, uh, the, there's a big library of small groups. And you can see their Cayley diagrams. You can change the generating sets and see how that changes. And, you, and they sh uh, show the multiplication tables. And in that program, they omit the first column and the first row. Okay, so multiplication tables can visually reveal patterns that may not be difficult to see otherwise. So to help make these patterns more obvious, we often color the cells of the multiplication table like we did in the previous slide, assigning a unique color to each action of the group. Not, not necessary, but it, it doesn't hurt. So if in the visual group theory textbook, if you look at page 47 and figure 4.7, that's a nice way to remember it, um, there's a whole bunch of examples of, of tables of smaller uh, groups, well, smaller groups, so groups of probably size less than 30. So, so take a look at that if you want some examples. Um, another comment, a group is abelian. That means the order of the multiplication does not matter if the table is symmetric about the main diagonal. So um, I don't want to say this. So in other words, if you want to multiply, so if you have A here and B here and A here and B here, then a, this entry is AB, and this entry is BA. But if the group is abelian, these things are the same. And so um, if you were to, when I say it's symmetric, if you were to flip the multiplication table along this main diagonal, um, these two entries are going to get mapped to each other. And finally, in each row and each column, each group action occurs exactly once. That kind of this will always happen. Think about why. You know, why can a column or a row not actually have the same element twice? Well, okay, let's let's prove this. Let's state and prove this last comment as a theorem. So our theorem is that an element cannot appear twice in the same row or column of a multiplication table. And here we will actually prove the statement for row. And on your homework, you will do the statement um, for columns. So let's suppose that in a row A, the element G appears in column B and C. So, so what we have is we have a multiplication table like this. And in some row A, there's a column B and there's a column C. And this element G appears twice. So what does that mean? That means that A times B equals g, again, because a times b equals g. But it also means that a times c equals g. So a times c equals g. And I claim that that's going to cause a little bit of a problem. So, so here's what I just wrote by hand. Algebraically, it means that a, b, and a, c both equal g. OK, now let's multiply everything here on the left by A inverse. In other words, A inverse AB equals A inverse G equals A inverse AC. And look what happens. The, the A's, or these things cancel, as do these, and we get that B equals C. And indeed, this thing here is equal to B 
and this here, of course, is equal to C. So B and C are both equal to A inverse G. So this is actually not a proof by contradiction, though it seemed like it was going to be that way. Instead, what we did is we said, suppose that in some row A, we have an element that appears in two columns, column B and column C. Not necessarily assuming they are different. I'm just saying, suppose G appears in two columns, B and C. We proved that B and C are the same column. So no contradiction there. We just proved that. But what we, I guess what we concluded from this is that G cannot appear in two different columns because anytime it appears in two, they have to be the same. So in other words, any element G cannot appear twice in the same row. Now the proof that two elements cannot appear twice in the same column is very similar, and that's left as a homework exercise. And really the only difference is that instead of multiplying on the left by A, you multiply on the right by A. Let's do another example. This is the group D3. Let's fill out a multiplication table for the group D3. And recall here are several different presentations. So in both of these presentations, the group is generated by a rotation R and a reflection F. And this R has order 3. R cubed is the identity. That's obvious. R, R, R is the identity. F squared is the identity. Uh, F, F is the identity. And then there's two different ways to describe how R and F interact. So this one is R, F equals F, R squared. So in other words, R, F is the same thing as doing F, R squared. But here's a different way we can do We can say any time that we do R, F, R, it's just the same as F. And notice that that holds from anywhere. If we start from here and we do R, F, R, that's the same as if we had just done F. So here's the multiplication table. Um, and here are the six elements. I have chosen not to remove the first column of the first row corresponding to the identity. I like having it in there. It's not that much of a burden. Um, so observations. What patterns do you see? Notice that according to our previous theorem, um, each row contains one and only one uh, color and element. And same with each column. You can't have two in one row or two in one column. And also notice that because this group is non-abelian, in other words, the order matters, that this group is not symmetric about this main diagonal. So um, you can see that because you, you have th these three pink squares here, but over here you, you don't have that symmetry. Here. You don't have these three being pink. You have these two and this one. One more thing, just for fun. Uh, let me ask you, what group do you get if you actually remove this relation up here from the presentation? So let's get rid of this and say, what group is that? And here's a hint. We've actually seen it recently. So I encourage you to now pause the lecture and try it for yourself. Spend a few minutes on it. Um, and, and then come back, and I will show you how to do it. OK, so um, did you get it? Well, let's see. Let's just try to draw it. So we have a group, again, generated by a red arrow and a blue double arrow, or blue arrow, with f squared as the identity. So let's, um, so let's try to draw this. So where can I fit this? How about here? So there, there's, um, there's maybe the, the identity node. There's something else. So let's, let's call this E. I'm not going to label most of the nodes. Um, and then this last relation says R, F, R equals F. So that means that if we start out doing R, and then we do F, and then we do R again, then we get back to if we had just done F. So if we had just done F, we're here. So in other words, R, F, R equals F. So that means we have to have this red arrow here. And the same thing happens no matter what node we start at. So if we, if we are here and we do R, F, R, we get, that's the same thing as doing F. So in other words, this pattern repeats. Do it like this. And let me do it like this. Let me do one more in this direction. So it's like this, and then it repeats forever. And yes, this is the Cayley diagram of a couple of those freeze groups. And notice that what this Cayley diagram here is what you get if you take this one and you sort of wrap it up into a circle 
with order 3. So this thing is like wrapped around itself with periodicity 3, and if you were to unwrap it, you would get something like this. And unwrapping it just corresponds to killing this relation right here. Pretty neat, right? Finally, the last thing I want to do in this lecture is, is introduce you to a group called the quaternions. This is a group of size 8, and there are not very many groups of size 8 out there because 8 is just, a, it's just a very small number. And this, this is a neat one that we're going to use uh, throughout the class as examples. So here are two different ways to lay out the Cayley diagram right here. I um, should say that the group elements or the actions are, um, are these eight things, uh, 1, i, j, and k, and then the negative of those. And you can think of i as the square root of negative 1. So it's like the imaginary number that, that you all learned years ago. And you can also think of j and k as imaginary numbers as well, because um, these things, you notice that they, they square to be negative 1. In other words, if, if you start at the identity, which we will call by 1 here, and you do i squared, you get negative 1. If you start um, at, if you do j squared, that's the blue arrow, twice, you get negative 1. And then what's k? Well, let's see, k is up there, so how do you get to k? So a k is just i times j, and if you do that again, so red blue times red blue, you get to be negative 1 as well. Multiplication of 1 and negative 1 in this group works exactly how you think it does. Um, and multiplication of the other six elements, i, j, k, and their negatives, works like the cross product of unit vectors in R3. Now here's how I like to think of this. I like to think of it as, I'm going to draw out i, j, and k, and then I'm going to put some lines here. This is sort of a old mnemonic. Um, and if you multiply in the, in the clockwise order, um, it stays positive, and if you multiply counterclockwise, it stays negative. So here's what I mean by that. So i, j equals k. That's i times j equals k. j times k equals i, so j times k equals i. k times i equals j. k times i equals j. And now if you swap the order of those, um, you get the same thing except for a negative sign. So, so you can think with this diagram, you can think of a, about multiplying counterclockwise. So j i equals k, j times i equals negative k. Did I say negative k the first time? Well, k times j equals negative i, so k times j equals negative i, and i times k equals negative j. i times k equals negative j. Here are two possible presentations for the group. Um, so this group can be present. You can say that it's generated by i, j, and k with the relations that i squared and j squared and k squared, and actually i times j times k as well, are all equal to negative 1. Um, or you can present it like this. You don't actually need that k, because notice these Cayley diagrams don't have an arrow for k. Although sometimes it's, it's just nice to have this, because you can see right away what the elements are. So here's another way to present it. You can say it's generated by i and j, like what we have up here. And then i to the fourth and j to the fourth are 1. So let's check that. So i to the fourth is red, 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 red. And j to the fourth is, uh, sorry, j to the fourth is blue, 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 blue. Both of those are equal to 1. Um, so then you have to explain how i and j um, multiply together. So um, so you could say that um, i j equals um, j negative i. You could say that, but here's another way to do it. i j i equals j. So starting here, let's check that. i j i does indeed equal j. So notice that what you're doing here is you're tracing out this path of order 4, saying like red, blue, red equals blue inverse. 